Praise the Lord. Let's stand and read Psalms 150 before we open up with our opening song. This was on my heart. I wanted to share it with the congregation. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the sultry and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him on the string instrument and the organ. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Praise him on the high sounding cymbals. Let everything, let everything, let everything that have breath, let everything that have breath, praise ye the Lord. I don't know what you come to do, but I come to lift him up. Look at somebody and say, that's a command. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, put your hands together and praise the Lord. I love to praise him. Put your hands together. Come on. I love to praise him, you say. I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. Everybody say. Hallelujah. Oh, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
love to praise him. <laughs> Good morning again. Please forgive me, I cannot help it. I'm full of joy. I'm full of joy. God moves in a mysterious way. He's won us to perform. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Our scripture lesson is coming from the 100th Psalm. Psalm 100. This is brand new. Our translation is the revised of King James. So the words may be a little different, but it doesn't matter which version you have. Once is the word of God, the Holy Bible. Psalm 100. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his people. The sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. And his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. May the Lord bless the reading. For our sick list, prayer list is long. We are praying for the Cromwell, Turner, and Lattimore family on the loss of their knees. Praying for the family of Brother Jeff Willie Dupree. Praying for the family of Brother Terry Cagall II. We are praying for the Christian family, Christian Arnold family, if, uh, as a matter of fact, the entire Arnold family. We are praying for Sister Tanya Smith, the family of Dr. Emmanuel Ayodele. We are praying for Reverend Melvin Carter, praise God, he's out of the hospital and recovering from home. <laughs> Baby Zander uh, Wilson, Sister Cookie Britt, Brother William Ward, Len, he travels somewhere, he'll soon be back. Brother A.J. Black, Reverend Larry Peoples, Brother Michael Stein, Sister Violin Harris, Sister Travis and family, Mother Emula Peoples, Sister Leona Banks. Brother Mark Charles, he's still at the Veterans Hospital in Orange County, but he's coming on. Praise God, we went there to see him. Sister Joel Smith, Sister Sandy Mack, Mother Brenda Giles, Mother Shelley Tyers, Reverend Bobby McGee, Mother Shelley Nevers, she was here two weeks ago. Praise God. Mother uh, Wellmo Woodhouse, Sister Deborah Bradley, Sister Lynette Steele. Please pray for Mother Oritha Yazir, our family. Three of her sisters are sick in Maryland. One of her brothers is in the hospital. It is serious. But God still stand. So in your individual prayers, we'll pray. And as we pray again, we say glory to God. 
we see this huge change this morning up here. To God be the glory. Great thing is done. Let us pray, our Father which art in heaven. Lord, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we say thank you. We bless your name. We praise you. We say hallelujah. We say glory because you are so good, because you are so merciful, because you are so kind, because you are so loving. Oh, glory to you. Hear our prayers, oh Lord. Let your will be done. And each day, individually, collectively, please, of your choosing, give us an under shepherd of your choosing for Mount Zion. We say hallelujah. Lord, we pray for these musicians here this morning that will lift up their voices and praise you. Glory, hallelujah. Thy will be done. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Let all the saints say amen, amen, and amen. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. All you gotta do is say what I say. Is that all right? Put your hands together, Zion. Come on. You at home, you need to get in the sanctuary so you can be a part of this magnificent praise and worship. All right, it's not too late. Come on. Put your hands together. Just say what I say, all right? Say, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Say it again. This is the day that the Lord has made. This yeah. is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad. So we say Hallelujah. We bless your name.
like Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Oh, come on, let's fill the room with Jesus. Who woke you up this morning? Who woke you up this morning? Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands all over the room. We come to bless his name in this place. I don't know about you, but I need a miracle by Friday this week. I need a miracle by Friday this week. Somebody might need one next month, next year. But I got to go somewhere where I need to sit and hear them say, we thought we saw this, but now we see this. I know there's somebody in the room that has already experienced that. So I need you to flood the atmosphere to help increase my faith that God is able. God is able. God is able. I'm trusting him. I'm believing him for a miracle. Anybody else in the room need a miracle? Come on and raise your faith. Come on, lift your hands. Say, God, I need a right now miracle. You are here. Moving in this place And we worship you That's what we got in our cars And came here to do today You are here Turning lives around And we worship you Worship you All because you are we make a way, make a way, make a way, make a way, we make a way, 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 You see, we make a miracle, we make a miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in this place, I worship you, I worship you, oh because you we make a way, make a way, make a way, Promise keep light yeah. in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a everybody say, we make a miracle work. Promise, Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. A way in the desert that is who you are. That is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never, everybody say. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't, even when I don't, I don't see it, it, you're working. Yeah. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never, you never stop. stop, you never stop working. Never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Say working. even when I don't, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when even when I don't feel it, you're Even when I don't stop, never, 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 never,
by this week Friday so I don't know about you but I'm thanking God I'm looking for a miracle I expect the impossible I feel the intangible I see the invisible I'm already sitting there looking for a miracle I expect the impossible I see the invisible, I feel the intangible. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm looking for a miracle. Come on, y'all. I'm looking for a miracle. Baby, I'm looking. I'm looking for a miracle. Yeah, yeah. You say, way
First Sunday morning breakfast, and thank you to Bob and the team for preparing breakfast. I want to also shout out that we have Evie Hill the third on the drums. Praise the Lord. And I bring your announcements for this week. We are continuing to pray for all families who have lost loved ones. Thank you to all who came out to support Sister Tanya Smith, who is here today. We are continuing to pray for you and the loss of your son. Women's ministry meeting will meet today at 12 o'clock right in the sanctuary. We will also have a brief pulpit committee meeting in the library. It is your last chance today to complete the pastoral congregational survey. So we want your input. Please see a brother Schuyler or Deacon Schuyler for those surveys. Save the date on August 17th, we will have the men's and women's ministry bowling outing, and those will be coming out shortly. Um, the 24th, we have the women's ministry mental health activity here at Mount Zion at 11 o'clock a.m. And on the 31st, we have our annual church picnic. We'll have a, a special announcement shortly. I want to um, ask Mother Hawkins to stand up and come up. Um, I want to say happy birthday to our church mother and team leader, Mother Hetty Hawkins. Mother Hawkins celebrated a birthday this week. We wanted you to know that we love you and we appreciate all that you do for Mount Zion. So now we'll have a special announcement. purchase your uh, picnic t-shirt. Oh, there'll be shirts? Yes, there'll be shirts. You can see myself or Skylar for more information. Awesome. Thanks for the info. It's going on my calendar right now. Mount Zion Picnic, Saturday, August 31st, Carson Park, 
12 to 4. Yes, it's going to be a great, great, great time. So be there or be square. Good morning again, Mount Zion. Before I even ask if we have any visitors, well, Ed the Third, welcome. Good to see you. Yay. My goodness, Sister Sutherland. Good to have you here. Now, my brothers and sisters, you are not visitors, but I am so overwhelmed you forgive me. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Now, do we have any visitors among us? If any visitors, will you please stand so we will, there is one right there. So we will, there is another one down here. Please remain standing. Please remain standing. We welcome you to Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. We want to let you know that you already know or may not, there are so many churches in Los Angeles that you have passed by to come here to visit with us. Feel at home. If you don't have a church home, you're in the right place. Uh, those cards the ushers gave you, please put them in the offering plate, your name on it and thing, and you will be contacted. And again, welcome. Have a blessed day. Please be seated. <clears throat> We continue to praise God this morning. It is time to give. Our usher will be prepared. God has blessed us. We need to bless our church. Amen. Even though July has gone, we just started August. But just a reminder, our church is 132 years old. We praise God, 132 years old. You know what that means, family. Please, if you haven't, you know what that means. Grab that envelope, just put on the church anniversary. I know you can do it. You have but let's keep trying. That's our church. You can see the light shining on it already. Praise God from home. All blessings flow. Let us pray, Father. You've given so much. You are giving so much to us. And you will be giving much more to us. We come to say thank you. Bless the givers, Lord. Your will be done. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's get our offering ready. Offering.
Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let us be reminded today we'll be having the Lord's Supper. This is first Sunday of the Holy Communion. Be prepared. Now, Mount Zion, we are ready. Are we ready for the word? Yes, yes we are. We're ready for the word. With this kind of singing we have from those voices, from the instrument, the organ playing, we are ready for the word. Praise God. The word will be brought by Reverend Henry Brown. He's no stranger. He's no guest. He's been here several times. We've heard him. He's good. Let's prepare to listen to him. After a selection, the next voice you will hear will be that of Reverend Henry Brown from McCoy. Bless you. Enter into worship, Zion. Open up your mouth. Lord, you're excellent. You're wonderful. None like you in all the earth. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Lord, we praise you for you are wonderful. Lord, we praise you for you are wonderful. Lord, we praise you for you are wonderful. Lord, we praise you because you are wonderful. Lord, there's nobody like you. Lord, we say thank you. You woke us up this morning. You started us on our way. Lord, we thank you. You brought us to your house of worship, and already you manifested your spirit in this place. Lord, we say thank you. Father, we can feel you in the room. Lord, we thank you this morning. As you prepare to speak to us, Lord, we ask that you will give us utterance to speak, boldness, and the ability to make known the hidden mysteries of your gospel. Lord, we pray for your will to be satisfied, that your name to be glorified, that your kingdom to be realized, your children to be edified, lost be evangelized, and ultimately may Satan be horrified. Father, if there's anything in us that creates hindrance, Lord, we ask for cleansing that your word would have free course. We thank you now for what we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, let every heart say amen. 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 Again, come on, won't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? This is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His soul shall make a boast in him. Man, it's just, it's, it's good to be here. I'm full. I think some of you know um, that our pastor is in the, is in the hospital. And um, today at 5 o'clock, we're having a, a prayer service for him. And yet, with all of that, the Lord is still good. Yes. Amen. I wish I had a witness. The Lord is still good. And it's just good to be in the house one more time. Amen. Y'all doing all right today? Come on, help me thank this choir. That was tremendous. That was tremendous. I felt every bit of that. Now, Dr. Patterson, Patterson would say, if that didn't ring your bell, your clappers broke. Come on, help me thank them one more time. Help me thank them. We give honor to the leadership here. Won't you stand with me for the reading of the word of God? Um, this is a very familiar passage. I thought it would just be fitting for our church this morning. And then I thought it just might be fitting for you as well. Psalms 37, verses 23 and 24. Will you have it say amen? amen? Let me read this for you. The steps of a good man, they are ordered by the Lord. And he delighted in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholded him with his hand. For the sake of context, look at verse 25. I have been young, now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He said, after I thought about it, after I looked over my life, after I've taken everything into account, he says, I've been young and I'm old. And everything in between, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I want to talk about that. The Lord is in your steps. God bless you. The Lord is in your steps. There is an expression that goes something like this. 
he who fails to plan plans talk to me fail he who plans to fail he who plans to who he who fails to plan i keep twisting it up plans to fail it's just the idea that there has to be some planning if you're going to be successful at anything that tied to success is some planning. But I live long enough now to know that you can do all the planning in the world. You can dot every I, you can cross every T, and yet things not go according to plan. Am I talking to somebody here some of your plans didn't work out? Some of your plans didn't come, didn't come through. You know, when you're young, you, you, you imagine what your life is going to be like in the future. I remember me and my friends in high school, me and my friends talked about what our careers would be, where we would be by X amount of years, you know, how many kids we would have, how, what kind of home we would have. And needless to say, most of my plans didn't, didn't, didn't happen by that time. I always saw myself having a son and um, I, I just, I just envisioned it. I just figured I would have, as much as I love children, I would have me a son. And I figured, I, I didn't envision that my son would dress like me. I envisioned that when I made my clothes, I would have my son's clothes. I, I envisioned my son and I coming in the church together looking just alike. Only problem with that was, that was not in God's plan. So I've settled on being the favorite uncle because children was not in God's plan for me. And I had a hard time adjusting to that because I just figured all of my siblings got kids, I, I just figured I'd have some too. And those were not in the Lord's plan. I never saw myself as a preacher. I never saw myself working full time in my church. Those were not in my plans. And yet, they were in the Lord's plans. And I'm not complaining because when I thought about what I wanted to be, and when I think about what he made me, I'm glad he altered <laughs> my plans. Do I have a witness in here? Am I talking to somebody here that, that you, that your plans and the Lord plans seemingly have moved in opposite directions? Whether it was through marriage, whether it was your career, your finances, somehow what you envisioned and what the Lord has envisioned for you having came together yet. And here's the thing. There are some unexpected turns that can happen in your life that was never a part of your plan. There's some things that can spring up in your life. And if you're not careful, they're frightening. They're frustrating. They're, they're, they're scary. And yet... The Lord has intertwined them in your steps. Interesting thing about this particular psalm because it suggests the idea that David seemed to suggest wisdom over worrying. He says the ideal here is the more you know about God, the more you learn of how God operates and how God moves, the less worrying you'll do. 
Watch what he looks. He says, verses 1 and 2, he says, don't worry about the ungodly. He said, because they soon shall be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. In verses 3 and 4, he says, put your trust, he says, and delight in the Lord. Five and six, he says, trust God to, per, to protect you, not only protect you, but to promote you. Verses seven and eight, he says, find rest in God who deals with the wicked. Nine through 11, again, he comes right back around and says, trust that God. Out of 11 verses, he mentions the word trust three times, which seemed to suggest the way that you deal with worrying. The way or the antidote for worrying is putting your trust in the Lord. Am I talking to somebody in here this morning? And he says, trust in God. He comes all the way down to verse 24 and suggests the idea that yes, life will give you some unexpected turns. Yes, there's some things that you may plan that won't work out. Yes, there'll be some things that hurt you. Yes, you'll have some disappointments. But understand this, that your steps have been ordered by God. Do I have a witness in here? That God is seemingly in your steps. There's three things I want to show you, and I'll take my seat. First thing I want to suggest for our understanding this morning, I want you to know that God is in the plans of your steps. Watch what the Bible says. He said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. This word steps, Miss Odd in the Hebrew, literally it suggests steps, but figuratively it means companionship. Watch what he says. He says the ideal here that God is the one who orders your steps. And since he's the one who orders your steps, he's the companion in your steps. He's the one that walks with you in your steps. He's the one that journeys with you along the way. What is he saying, Henry? He's simply saying you are not alone in your steps. I know that sometimes you feel like you're all by yourself. Sometimes you feel it, you feel as if you have nobody in it with you. But he says the one who orders your step is walking with you every step of the way. That ought to be good news because it says nothing else. That if I get nothing else out of this text, if, I, if nothing else grabbed me, it says to me that, Henry, you got the Lord with you in every situation of your life. Do I have a witness in here? This word is born out of a word called sa'ad. And sa'ad suggests the idea um, pace, that the God is in the pace of, of your steps. God is the one who determines how fast you move. God is the one that determines at what pace you move. And sometimes God says go, and other times God says no, and sometimes God says slow because he's in your steps. Do I have a witness in here? Watch what it suggests. And maybe that's why the writer in Hebrew says this in Hebrews 13. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says that we may be able to call the Lord our helper because he's my companion along the way. Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, he says, I'm with you always, even until the ends of the earth. He says, no matter how far you travel in this life, you got me by your side. He says, I'm right there with you. And that ought to be good news to somebody that to know that you got God right there with you when you when your friends are not there and your family is not there and loved ones are not there. The Lord says, I'm right there with you, even when it's silent, even when you don't think I'm listening, even when you can't hear me talking back to you, understand that you are never alone. Do I have a witness in here? It's a just idea that God is involved in the details of my steps. 
Watch what Luke says. Luke says in chapter 12, watch what he says, talking about God. He knows the number of hairs that's on my head. The number of hair follicles, he says, God knows. Watch this. God is intimately involved in my head that he knows every strand, every number of hairs that's on me. Wait a minute. He knows what's on my head. He knows what's on your head. He's that involved. Now, let me compare it to about what man knows. Can I, let me, can I share with you some things that man knows? Man says this, women who have red hair, and I'm not talking about dark and lovely. I'm not talking about some Beijing. I'm not talking about no cellophane or none of that other stuff. I'm talking about what you're born with. Are you with me? Women who are born with red hair have fewer than 90,000 hair follicles. Person with black hair has anywhere from 100 to 110,000 hair follicles. Person with brown hair has anywhere from 110 to 120,000 hair follicles. A person with blonde hair has more than 150,000 hair follicles in their hair. That's what man knows. But the text says God knows the exact number that's on your head. What am I trying to say? If God is that intimately involved with your head, don't you think he's involved with your feet? Okay, I'm going home. If he knows, if he knows how many hair follicles you have, don't you know he knows every step that you make? He knows every step that you take. And the reason why he knows, because the text says he's right there with you. Do I have a witness in here? He said he knows. Now, watch this. Watch this. He says he has ordered them. The word kun would suggest the ideal to erect. It also means to set up, right? Now, the ideal of setting up something is to do something in advance. I hope you're listening to me. You set up the room for the party in advance. You don't wait till the party start to set up the room. You do it in what? Advance. Because he's ordered my steps, he has set my steps up in advance. What are you saying, Henry? Long before you ever got here, God had already navigated, had already set up your steps. Do I have a witness in here? But it also means to frame. Building a house, you lay the foundation, but the next thing you do is you set the frame. Before you can ever add any roofing, before you can add any plywood, before you can add a brick, a drywall, some electrical, you got to frame it. Watch what he says. The word says to frame. God frames my steps. Now, here's the thing. This house will never be complete until the Lord comes back again. So he's constantly working on the frame. He's constantly working on the building. That's why things keep happening in your life because he's constantly working on the building. Doesn't matter how old you get, you can live. I don't care how long, God will constantly be working on the building. That's why you can live a long time and still have stuff happening in your life because God is constantly working on the building. He sets them up in advance, but he also framed them. But the word also means, to, it means suitable. Watch this. Your steps are just right for you. I'm going to say that one more again. Maybe I can say it over here. Your steps are just right for you. Okay, maybe I'll look at the choir. Your steps are just right for you. What am I saying? I don't have time to be looking at somebody else and their steps, their course of life, because God made my steps 
just right for me. He said, they're suitable for you. Maybe that's why he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he said, I will suffer you to be tempted, but I will not give you no more than you're able to bear. He said, because your steps are made just for you. Are you with me? And that's when, watch what he says. Your steps has his own DNA. Are you with me? Grammatically, it's used in the perfect tense. Perfect tense is past action with present results would suggest the idea. God has set them up. He's laid them out. He's framed them. He says, long before you and I ever got here. So now watch what it says. You can never say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or they shouldn't have done that. If they hadn't have done that, this wouldn't have happened. You can't say that because, now watch what, it, watch what it is. God is never playing catch up to your decisions. I'm going to say that more. He's never playing. God is never reacting to any decision that you make. He's never playing catch up. Watch what it says. When I think like that, I'm insulting the fact that God has foreknowledge. I'm insulting his omniscience that he knows everything. God doesn't say, oh, my God, they did this, so let me turn around and do that. No. His foreknowledge and the fact that he knows everything, you know what he says? Because they're going to do this, because they're going to do that, let me navigate their steps this way. Are you with me? What am I trying to say? There's a synergistic relationship between God's sovereignty and my free will. God takes and joins my free will with his sovereignty. What am I saying? Because he knows everything that's going to happen, because he knows every possible outcome, because he knows the decision that you're going to make, he's able to marry your free will with his sovereignty to get the best out of you. And so that's how come you can exercise your free will and God still accomplish his goals in your life because he knew what you were going to do before you did it. Are you with me? That ought to be good news for somebody. Right? Watch this. He, he, so you can't say, you can't say, you know, if they hadn't have done that. No, it's been a part of their steps before they got here. Are you with me? Watch what he says. This word suggests the idea. Watch this. That every situation in your life is only a dot on the canvas of the portrait that God is painting of you. He takes everyone. You know, in school, we used to, in elementary, we used to have um, what they call it, dot to dot. Did y'all ever have them? I know this younger generation probably ain't had it. But dots to dot, dot to dot, you, you couldn't see what the image really was. It was a bunch of dots and you had to connect all of the dots. Once you connect all of the dots, you got an image before you, right? And that's what every situation in your life is. Every situation is a dot. Every up is a dot. Every down is a dot. Every problem is a dot. Every heartache is a dot. Every good time is a dot. And God is using all of that to paint the portrait of your life. Well, let me see if I can explain it this way. About 20 years ago, I was my sister... She worked for a medical office in Beverly Hills, and I was meeting her for lunch. Got there, and I wasn't feeling so well. And so she went in the back and came out, gave me something, and I took it. Right? And the um, young lady told on her, and she got terminated. And I felt bad because I felt like, Carl, I got my sister fired, right? over something that I, we could have gone to CVS or something and picked up, right? And so she's out of work for a little bit. F friend of mine had connections, got her a job at another medical facility doing what she was doing. And about a year or two after that, my parents were moving to Houston, and she wanted to go, 
but she didn't want to go through the process of trying to find a job and everything all over again. And she's talking on her job, and her boss said, well, Teresa, we have an office in Houston. Let me make a call. She comes back and she says, you know what? They got an opening. You can just transfer. You ain't got to look for a job. It's, you can take your job to Houston. Now here, she was single. She gets to Houston. She meets her husband. Here she was living in an apartment. They just finished building their second home from the ground up, right? And so now I take credit for it. I tell her, I walk in her house, I said, girl, if I wasn't sick and you hadn't given me that stuff, you never would have got fired. You never would have got the other job that you got. You never would have been able to transfer. You never would have gone to Houston. You might still be here in the apartment. You never would have met your husband. You wouldn't even be in this big old house right now if I hadn't got sick. So I feel like you owe me. What am I saying? You don't know how God is trying to connect the dots in your life. You don't know what God is doing when you're going through your situation. So you can't run from your situation. You can't abandon your trials because you have no idea how God is trying to navigate your steps to get you to the place he wants you to be. Do I have a witness in here? He says they have been ordered by the Lord. I won't spend much time with that because you know he's the self-existent one. You know he holds all power in his hand. You know he don't need no help from nobody else. He's God and he's God all by himself. So I won't spend time trying to tell y'all that. But watch this. He says they've been ordered by the Lord, but here it is. He delighted. This word delight means is kafex, which means to to incline, to bend. Here's the picture. As, as a parent bends to watch his baby take his first steps and the joy that that parent feels, this text suggests that's what the Lord feels when you and I are stepping in the right direction. When you and I are stepping in the right direction, it's as, it's as if God, the loving father, is saying, that's it. You got it. Come on. Come to me. Come closer. You're coming. You're doing pretty good. That's it. Stand a little more. Don't, don't I know you're shaking, but it's going to be just, just, just come to daddy. The Lord, has, see, and what am I saying? It's, it's what you do in your steps that turn God on. What am I saying? When I have a situation that's not pleasing, when I have a situation that hurt, I can either bruise over my situation or I can bless the Lord in my situation. And that's what Job did when he lost everything. He said, the Lord give it and the Lord take it away. He said, watch it, blessed be the name of the Lord. Watch what he said. He said, I'm not going to talk down about God. I'm going to talk good about him because regardless of what I'm going through, God is still good. Am I talking to somebody who knows that no matter what you're going through, no matter your ins, your outs, your ups, your downs, your hurts, your disappointment, at the end of the day, God is still good. Do I have a witness in here? He says he delights, he takes pleasure, he gets excited when I'm praising him in my steps. And so it's what you do in yourself. Now watch this. Is even what you say. Watch what it suggests. That my mouth and my feet need to be in concert together. Are you with me? It's what you say. And it's not only what you say in your situation. It's what you say, it's what you say to somebody else in their situation. You know, because sometimes, you know, we can get killed by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. 
Did y'all hear what I said? Sometimes it's the one that's close to you. It's the one, it's, it'd be the one that say they love you who can, who, who can do more damage. Right? And so it's what you learn how to say when somebody else is going through it. Do you, do, you, do you pick them up? Do you encourage them? Or do you tell them what they should have done? And if it was you, you never would have done it like that. And the reason why you are in this situation is, is do you hear me what I'm saying? You got to be careful how you deal with somebody else in their situation. That's why Proverbs 25 said, a word that is fitly spoken is as apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Watch this, apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Number one, they're valuable. The right word at the right time can heal, it can hurdle, it can help. The right word at the right time, but now the wrong word at the wrong time can discourage and damage. Can I ask you, what are you saying in your situation? Can I ask you, what are you saying in somebody else's situation? He says, I got to be able to say the right stuff, right? Watch the text. It says he delighted in his way, right? Direct course of life, right? The progress, the journey forward. He says, and think about a journey. A journey has to deal with traveling from one place to another, and it speaks of a considerable distance and amount of time. All of us are on a journey. All of us are headed home. This is not your home. Do I have a witness in here? And it may take some time for us to get there, but the question is, as you're stepping, what are you doing with God as you wake your way home? Are you with me? Watch this. Metaphorically, it's just the ideal growth, right? Every step, God is trying to grow you. Every step, God is trying to add to you. Every step, God is trying to perfect you. Every step, God is trying to give you something that you don't have. That's, again, I know it's redundant, but that's why you can't run from your problems because it's God trying to give you something. Are you with me? Watch what he says. Secondly, he says not only is God planned, in our steps, but God's predetermined pitfalls are in your steps. The very next text says, as he said all of that, the very next word says, though he fall. Right? The word fall, nafal, suggests the idea most people think is, is sin, but that's not the meaning here. The meaning deals with every type of setback imaginable. It deals with basic disappointments. It deals with you trying something and failing. It means you being disappointed by something. It means in your sickness. It means it has a multiplicity of different things. He says, though you fall, though you have had some setbacks, though you have been disappointed, though you tried some stuff and it didn't work out, though you failed at some things, though you have made some mistakes, though you are weak, though you are sick, he says, though you fall, you should not be utterly cast down. Watch what he says. He says, no matter what you're going through, he says, it'll never be the end for you. He says, though you fall, you'll never stay down. That ought to be good news to somebody. You, you'll never, watch this, with God, you'll never reach a point to where you can't recover. And that ought to be good news because sometimes we'll put thumbs down on people. Sometimes we'll, we'll look at people and say they'll never be nothing. We'll look at people and say they'll never make it. But with God, it doesn't matter how far you fall, you can always recover. He says you'll never reach a point in your life to where you cannot recover. Are you with me? Now, that's the conventional meaning, but can I, can I, can I at least allow me to break the word down to you because it'll, it, it'll definitely give you a different meaning. The word in the file is three Hebrew letters. It's the noon, it's the pay, it's the limit. The, the noon 
is speaks of a servant because the leather is bent it suggests the idea of a humbling servant one who is dependent upon his master and watch what he says the text says though ye fall right but it suggests I'm a servant I'm one who's connected to God God is my master and I'm dependent upon him the pay is the image of a mouth speaking. But majority of the time in used in scripture as God speaking. So my fall is God's opportunity to speak to a servant. You miss me. The limit is the image of a staff. It's used to urge, it's used to control, to correct. But the word limit, the letter limit suggests the idea, learning. So let me see if I can put it together. My fall is God's opportunity to speak to his servant that he might sometimes urge him in the right direction. My fall is God speaking to his servant that he might push him forward because sometimes you don't feel like moving. I wish I had a witness in here. And ultimately, my fall is God speaking to me in order that I might learn something. So every time you fall, every time you have a mishap, is God saying, let me take this moment that I might speak to you that you might get something that you don't have. Do I have a witness in here? That you might learn something about me that you don't know. That you might have an experience of me you never had. That you might see a side of me that you've never seen. And ultimately that I might push you to a level you've never been. He says, though he falls, he says he shall never be cast down. You'll never reach a point to reco from recovery. Why? God is trying to talk to you. Are you with me? God is trying to say something to you. God is trying to move you in the right direction. God is trying to teach you something that you don't know. Are you with me? And so it's not that I sin. And it's not that I'm in trouble. And not that I, 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 I've made God mad. No. It's whatever mishap that comes in your life. God takes these moments to say, now let me talk to my, let me talk to my child. Are you with me? Have you ever just had your parents to just sit down and talk to you every, when you was growing up, when you was going through something? Sometimes mama just sat down and said, let me talk to you. Whether it was big mama who said, let me sit down and talk to you. For me, it was a bunch of deacons in my church. Boy, let me sit down and talk to you. Are you with me? Those are moments that the Lord is trying to give you something, right? Finally, let me say this to you. So I have the predetermined pitfalls. I shall not utterly be cast down. And the reason why I won't be cast down is in the very next part of the verse. He says, for the Lord upholded him. Hebrew word samak, which suggests the ideal to support, to hold, to bear. But grammatically, this is where it gets interesting. It's in the imperfect tense. The fall is in the imperfect tense. Watch what God is saying. When he says fall is in imperfect, upholded is perfect tense. Watch what the Lord is saying. This ain't the first time you've fallen. I'm going to say that one more time. Henry, this ain't the first time you fell. He says, and I was the one back then who held you up. The same God that was back then holding you up, Henry, is the same God that's going to hold you up right now. 
And I'm looking at some people in here. This ain't the first time you've fallen. This ain't the first time you made a mistake. This ain't the first time you had a situation. This ain't the first time that God brought you out of something. And what God is trying to say, I'm the same God that was back then that will bring you out now. Am I talking to somebody there? Because y'all looking at me funny. Am I talking to somebody here? God had to bring you out of some stuff. God had to hold you up through some stuff. God had to pick you up out of some stuff. He said, this ain't the first time you've been through it. He says, so what you got to do, you got to be like David. David, when he got ready to fight Goliath, when they told him he couldn't do it, he said, there came a lion and a bear. He said, to take one of the sheep. He said, what I did was I killed the lion. He said, and I smoked the bear. He said, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he defied the armies of the living God. What did he do? You got to draw strength. You got to draw courage from what the Lord has done for you before. Do I have a witness in here? I'm looking at some people. I can tell God has brought you out. That's where you draw your strength from. Do I have a witness in here? He said what he does is he holds you up. He said with his hand. He said he'll hold you up with his hand. And an interesting thing, he says, it's the, it's the word yard. Yard is the open hand. Cuff is the closed hand. But the image of the yard looks like a thumb. What am I saying? It, you can't see the whole hand. All you can see is the thumb. What is God saying? When it comes to your situation, he says, I got so much power that I don't need my whole hand. I'm going home. Y'all missing me. I don't need my whole hand to fix your situation. I got power in this hand that's able to bring you through. I got enough power in my thumb that's able to lift you up. I got power that are able to bring you through. I don't need all of my hand. I just need some of my hand. Are you with me? That ought to be good news to somebody. That God has enough power in his hand. But you know, I couldn't help but think about this text. Couldn't help but think about Jesus in this text. Because Jesus utilizes the hand of God. When he was on the cross, he said, Father, he said, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Watch what I'm saying here. He said, Lord, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it all in your hands. It used to be a song that said this and that. I, I, I put it all in your hand. You can handle it. I wish I had a witness in here. You can handle it. He said, that's a fact. He said, I put it all in your hands. The story goes, he died, they buried him, but the good news is he didn't stay dead. Somebody said it was early Sunday morning. I wish I had a witness in here. Just before the break of day, the Bible says he got up with all power in his hand. Now notice when he was in trouble, he put it in God's hand. But when he came out, he says it all is in my hands. And it's the same hand that is able to bring you through. It's the same hand that is able uh, to lift you up when uh, you are down. It's the same hand uh, that's able uh, to turn uh, your situation around. Do I have a witness in there? Is there anybody here uh, you can testify that the Lord uh, has had you uh, in his hand? When you've been sick, uh, he had you uh, in his hand. Uh, when you've been down, uh, 
he had you in his hands the same hand that pushed up mountains the same hand that scooped out valleys the same hand that dressed the earth with daffodils and lilies he said I put it all in his hand and he's able to turn it around do I have a witness in here is there anybody here who knows what God can do he's able to move your mountain he's able to see you through he's to turn it around I wonder if I got a witness in here somebody who knows what God can do and if you know what he can do is if you know what the Lord can do he said you ought to pray like in there you ought to serve like in there you ought to live like it if you know what God can do you ought to give like in there love like it pray like in there if you know what God can do you ought to walk like in there talk like in there pray like in there he's able won't it do it come on let's praise him if you know he can, let's give him some praise. If you know he will, let's give him some praise. If he's done it for you, if he turned it around, come on, give God some praise. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The Lord is intimately involved in my steps. Every step I make, he's my companion. He's right there with me. He knows my decisions before I make them. So without ever infringing upon my free will, he takes them and marry them with his sovereignty. That ought to be good news to somebody. And no matter how far you fall, you'll never reach a point in your life that you can't recover because he holds you with the power of his hand. And then he gets to the end. He said, I was once young. Now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread God will be exactly what you need. I'm wondering this morning, if you're saved and you know that you're saved, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that when you leave this life, you will spend eternity with the Lord. Saved and you know it, will you elevate your head? Saved and you know it, lift them high. Saved and you know it. God bless you, you may put them down. I'm wondering if there's somebody here who would possibly say, you know, I really don't know where I would spend eternity. I'm not sure about my salvation, but I want to be. I want you to know the day could be your day that you develop a real and rich relationship with him. If you're unsure, we want to pray for you today. If that be your case, will you elevate your hand? We want to pray for you. Maybe somebody who say, I'm saved all right. I don't, I don't have a church home. I just kind of go from church to church. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, let us not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Amen. Just as well as you have a physical home to give you shelter, comfort, the Bible suggests that you have a spiritual home to do the same thing. Or maybe not a member of this church, but one day you hope to be. If that be your case, will you elevate your hand? We're going to all stand. The doors of the church is open. We want you to know that today could be your day. Today could be your day. The doors of the church is open. If you don't have a church home, if you're not sure about your salvation, today could be your day.
Give Reverend Brown a rousing hand. But we are not through yet. Thank you, deacons. I see you coming. Let's prepare for the Lord's Supper, the communion. See the deacons moving and coming. Everybody, let's think that time will be no more. Interesting when they were in the upper room. The Bible says that Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. Um, he he took the cup and he gave thanks. Let me tell you just a little bit of what was in the cup. Every sin of genocide was in the cup. Every mass shooting was in the cup. Every drive-by shooting, 
was in the cup. Every rape was in the cup. Every bank robbery, every form of injustice, Jim Crow laws was in the cup. Slavery was in the cup. A hundred million that died in the Middle Passage, it was all in the cup. And the Bible, wait a minute, let me bring it a little closer. Everything that I've done, everything that you've done, everything that we're doing, everything that we will do, the things that we pray that never come out about us was all in the cup. And the Bible says he took it and he told God, thank you. I don't know what that does for you, but it, 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 it lets me know what kind of God that I have, how much he loves me, that he would take all of my stuff, everything that I've done, he'd take it all. Everything that I'm doing, he'd take it all, pay for it, and then on top of that, tell God, thank you. Can I share just a little bit, you know, when they, when they beat him, Roman law says you can only hit a person 39 times. That's why you'll hear Paul say, I would beat five times with 39 slashes, save one. The law says you could not hit them more than 39 times. They dismissed that law when they began to beat our, our Lord and Savior. A Roman's whip was made out of lead and lamb bone. And every time they would hit him, they would take hunks of flesh from his body. So much so that you could not recognize that he was a man. And he did that for you. He did that for me. Someone asked the question, was it the Roman government that killed Jesus? No. Was it Pilate that killed Jesus? No. Was it the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees that killed Jesus? No. If you want to know who killed Jesus, all you got to do is look in the mirror. Because he did it just for me. And so when we come here, he says, as often as you do this. I know we have custom, we do it for Sunday, but the Bible says, as often as you do this, you are remembering my death and my suffering. I remember how his blood covers me. That when the Lord looks down at me, he doesn't see the real me. But he sees the righteousness of his son. I remember how his body was broken. So it suggests the idea that I ought to not come here unworthily. I ought to not take this here lightly. And that if there's anything that's on the inside of me, that creates hindrance between he and I, I should ask the Lord for cleansing. And so we're going to pray and we're going to serve. Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for this moment. Lord, we say we remember. Lord, we say thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us. Lord, we understand that it was you taking our place that you did it because of your love for us. And it was a thing that no one could do but you. Lord, we say thank you right now. Father, I pray that you would bless this bread that represents your body, bless this wine that represents your blood. And then, Lord, if there's anything in us that creates hindrance, Father, I pray that you would remove it where it might, that we might have access to you. We don't want to do it like some who became ill and others who died. Lord, we ask that you cleanse us afresh. Thank you now for what we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen.
that you hold in your hand represents our Lord's body that was beat, battered, and broken. Let us drink all of it and let us eat all of it. Wine that you hold in your hand represents our Lord's blood that was shared for the remission of our sins. Let us drink all of it. As often as we do this, we show forth his death and his suffering till he comes again. And the good news is he is coming again. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. All right. One day when I was lost, he died. Say, I know it was love. Come on, Zion. I know it was love. I know it was love for me. What? One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was love for me. They pierced him in the side. They pierced him in the side. Hallelujah. They pierced him. He hung his head and died. He hung his head and died. Hallelujah. He hung his head and died. He hung his head and died for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I hung his head and died for me. They laid him in the tomb. They laid him in the tomb. Oh, yes, they did. They laid him in the tomb. Oh, yes, they did. And he rose Last one. Everybody in the room said, he's coming. Coming back again one day. Coming back again. Hallelujah. He's coming back again for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And he's coming back again for me. All right, let's all stand. It's been a good day today. Amen. Come on, let's just thank the Lord for the day. Why are we thanking the Lord? Mom Zion, let us give Reverend Henry Brown another round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that message. And to remind us when uh, we dismiss, it will be a meeting in here for the ladies, the women, and then uh, we are told there will be a brief uh, pulpit committee meeting uh, at the pastor's uh, library. Reverend Brown, we thank you so much again from our heart. God continues to bless you. Another round of applause. And then we'll ask Reverend Brown to give us the benediction. Amen. It's always a joy to be here. Would you please lift my pastor up in prayer? Um, 
Yeah, this, I, I, I'm trying to tell our church, you know, there's no accidents with God. God doesn't waste time. And that he picks you for this moment. He could have picked anybody else, but he chose to pick us. And that there's something that the Lord wants to do through us, through him. Um, and so we've been chosen. So we embrace, we embrace it. And yet at the same time, it's, it's frustrating. So we're asking that you pray for him and that you would keep him lifted. Um, I don't think that the Lord would answer a, a, a prayer in one area to, um, to do damage in another area. I'll just say it like that. So we're praying for him. Lord God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this great church. We thank you for the wonderful worship experience we had. Thank you for all who are here. Lord, may we leave here understanding that our steps are intertwined with your will. And that, Lord, you are our companion in our steps. And when we fall, you're right there to hold us, to lift us up. And you hold us with the power of your hand. Lord, we say thank you. As we leave this place, we ask for traveling grace, journey, and mercies, and angels of protection. And at the point in time, Lord, would you, would you bring us back looking, wanting, and expecting to have an encounter with you. We lift up Dr. Williams today. We ask that your healing ministry will continue to move upon him as only you can. We just thank you for the journey, the experience, and all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. 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 Hug somebody, tell them you love them. God bless you.